Everybody, I think we'll try and get started. I know we're the last session of the day, so just hoping you can hang in there with a little bit of energy for us. Um, hope you've all had a great first day of the conference. Um, really excited to um, be here today with my co-panelists. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about stories of impact and how we're measuring um, what we're doing, how we're doing. Um, our lineup today. Um, our lineup today is a little bit different than advertised. Um, we had a last minute uh, cancellation, Lloyd wasn't able to make it, but we're really excited to welcome Nathan um, Atkinson from Local Projects to our lineup. Um, so we think we'll have a, a great conversation. Um, but starting us off will be uh, Mayana Gulma Bajman, who's the head of learning and interpretation from Aarhus Museum, which for those of you who don't know it, is an, an amazing museum uh, in Aarhus. Uh, Denmark, so she'll be talking a little bit about that. We have Emily Robbins from SFMOMA um, here in San Francisco, and then Nathan from Local Projects. And um, what we're really looking at is how we're doing as a sector in terms of measuring um, what we're doing. Um, we think we are individually setting our own goals and have lots of different ways of measuring what we're doing. But um, I think one of the reasons why we put together this panel was to have a really open dialogue about what's difficult, um, where, the, where the challenges are, um, how we are unable to kind of uh, create parallels across our organization so it's difficult about that because we each individually set our own goals and, and our own metrics. Um, but as I was thinking about this, I think there are some commonalities that we can start to draw out. And one of them is this um, quote from Bill Gates, which is really about setting goals and about having a continuous so we'll dig into that a little bit um, as we go. And we're also really trying to talk about how we can tell stories with the data that we look at. So get beyond clicks, get beyond kind of the quick numbers that we're often asked to produce to um, you know, help present our projects to funders or trustees. And really think about how can we go beyond that and think about the, the value of what we're doing. We, we're kind of uniquely placed within the digital sector. There's a lot of data available to us and we can often set our own measurements in ways that um, our colleagues in uh, more of the revenue sectors can't. Um, you know, the bottom line is really the, the main metric if you're trying to sell clothes. But for us, and this is I think where the, the, both the challenges and the complexities um, come in, we're often setting lots of different kinds of goals. And so um, I think we have, some, we have some work to do and some exciting things that we're looking to um, get into today with that. And with that, I'm going to hand over to our first presenter. And I should say, actually, we're going to do very short presentations. And then we're going to get into um, a little bit of a roundtable discussion. And really, our hope today is not so much to be kind of truth-saying truth from the um, from the podium, but to invite dialogue. So, you know, many of you will be working on these questions yourselves and have great um, experience to, to offer and to share. And our hope is really to kind of start a dialogue in, in this room about, um, about the subject. So um, please don't be shy when we get to that portion. Hello, my name is Marian. I'm Head of Learning and Interpretation at Arvas. It means that I is, I'm responsible for Ask Public, and I will come back to that in a minute. And I oversee the programs we have for children, youth, and adults, social programs too. Um, and my department is also involved in the exhibitions, especially when we want to have some engagement there too. So I'm very much on site. This is my, you can say, point of departure. Uh, I'm not responsible for the website. And I'm not responsible for social media. Uh, and what you see here is a museum. You see my director, Erland Heuerstein, standing on the top of the rainbow. And the rainbow is an artwork 
made by the Danish artist Olaf Eliasson. And you can also see the museum from the inside. And here we have an installation with the artist Joanna Vasconcelos from Portugal. Two years ago, we opened Ars Public. It's 1,900 square meters in the museum at level three. And it's a place where a lot of different things takes place, but each encourage participation. So we have an open studio where artists are and everybody can come in and talk to the artist about what she or he is doing. We have a, a shared uh, office a shared space where mainly students are sitting and working. We have a film club, we have debates, we have studios for children and adults too, uh, and a lot of other things. But what I would like to talk about today is the three digital stations which we made together with local projects, with Nathan, among other uh, good people from New York. And, um, and that will be the focus for these few minutes. But what is important with the objectives uh, is what kind of impact do you want to have in the world? And in this context, I would like to underline three here, because this is, these are objectives of the whole floor. But for now, it's interesting to talk about to make people, the objective to make people talk, be active, and to share the experiences, to connect art to the wider world and people's, to people's lives, and to gain greater insight into our users and how they experience art. Here we have the eye tracker. It tracks the movements of your eyes as you view a work of art. And uh, so you come to it and you sit down and you will see a work of art on the screen for 10 seconds. And after that, you will get a response. Here is how you look. Here is how you look different from the other people who tried it before you. Uh, and the whole thing is that it encourages us to reflect on how we see the world and why we don't all see the same things. And at the same time, the eye tracker helps us to take a long look. Uh, I don't know how it is here, but in Denmark we have reports saying that people are only using six seconds per artwork. We think it could be better, so we are doing what we can. Um, yeah, the next one is maybe a little more playful. Here you can create portraits based on works from the museum collections and your body. So it's a new way of browsing our collection, you could say, and people are having a lot of fun, laughing as never before in an art museum, so we are also, you know, trying to uh, to see what museum behavior can also be like. And then we have the recording booth, which is more for the personal conversations. It's a small room, safe room. You walk in and then you can choose an artwork. And the recordings, uh, the conversations are recorded. And uh, we give some questions. Some people use them, some doesn't, and that's fine. Um, and it's, it's just, I think this is my favorite, to be honest. Uh, because every morning, I also go, when I go to my office, I start by looking at one or two of the recordings from yesterday. Because it really reminds me about why I'm in this field. It connects me with the audience. Because to listen to people, to listen how they talk about art, is really... Uh, interesting and it provides the museum and me with insight into how museum visitors speak about art. I don't know I don't know how it is with you guys but <laughs> we have a lot of data but we do not have so much time always to analyze on the data and this gives me a day-to-day -day idea about who are up there, who are the real people and how do they talk about art and this makes it easier for me to to do my job well. And the same with the eye tracker. When I need to, if I should write a text about an artwork, I can go to the eye tracker and see, okay, everybody looked in this corner. This is really interesting. Maybe I should start my text there. Or maybe the opposite, nobody looked there. I will start my text by putting attention to that. So how do we measure the value of engagement? 
we use mixed methods. We have data from the stations and from the cameras in the area. And we have a lot of other things. And this is what we do for the whole floor. Uh, and I think it's, it's, of course, always very important to, to check how reality meets the objectives you started out with. And the learnings so far, and we can discuss this later, our, yeah, we think that mixed methods get the best picture. We think it's so important to meet the real people and share the stories, not only to the outside world, but also inside the organization. So we learn how people talk about art and make the exhibitions even more relevant to people, to our audience. And then, as you know, data is meaningless without a clear sense of purpose. It's so important you know why your organization exists. This why is so important, whatever you do. And then uh, data needs to be analyzed, but sometimes we do not have time for it, and then we can take this, the small wins and just find a way to, to uh, integrate it in an informal way in our daily life. I think that sometimes is an important thing. And data creates more questions than it answers. And I think it's important also to take the content to somewhere else and to make an impact on the organization with the impact you have. So it was a small introduce, introduction uh, from me. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Emily. I'm from SFMOMA, and what I do at SFMOMA is um, primarily the role of project coordination. Um, so I come at this question from a slightly different angle, perhaps, because to me, the question of how you measure data is very much a process question, um, and kind of intertwined with the entire question of how um, projects are planned and how they come together. Um, and so in having these conversations about um, how we go about measuring data that have been very productive so far with the group. Um, those are the types of questions that I have been bringing to the table and sort of wanted to interject into the conversation. Um, and noticing kind of differences in how the process of measuring data tends to play out for, um, depending on kind of when you're asking the question of what do you value, what is the goal within a particular project. Are you starting out a project with very specific goals and metrics that you're trying to target at the beginning? Or is the project much more like loose, exploratory? Or are you going to kind of wait till the end of the project before you kind of take a, a look back and see what was valuable about this? Um, yeah, so I've been wondering how that difference affects the way the projects play out and also affects the, the usefulness or the, the variety of learnings that can come out of that. Um, so in my experience, just observing the types of processes that we tend to have at the museum, they tend to kind of exist on a spectrum. Not everything is like extremely, extremely targeted and regimented on one end or just completely loose, free flying on the other end. Everything kind of exists on this continuum. But depending on where our project is on this spectrum, they end up kind of being structured and playing out in very different ways. Um, so for a very sort of high level example of a particular video, if you're starting from the idea of like, I want this video to achieve a very specific goal, that goal from the point of view, especially of the person who's, um, <laughs> no worries, um, from the point of view of the person who's executing that project, that goal leads directly to what are the tactics that we're going to use to achieve that goal, and those tactics then follow on to a whole infinite <laughs> number of tasks that all have to sort of be scheduled and coordinated and work together to be able to actually achieve that project in the given period of time. Um, whereas if we're working from a more kind of exploratory, often much more creative, but much more undefined angle, um, from a project management point of view, the instinct is kind of to say, I don't know exactly what we're doing, we kind of have an idea, but we're gonna figure it out, so let's just do all the tasks we can think of that might be useful to go into this end goal some of them will make it into the final product when we get to sort of the, the idea of shaping it later on, and some of them kind of end up being wasted effort in the end. 
Um, so with that, there comes trade-offs from each particular model when it comes to how much time and effort goes into a project and also what ends up being able to be learned about what that project did. Um, so the more targeted approach I found, you know, there's always kind of tensions between large stakeholder groups especially, but when goals are kind of defined and especially defined amongst larger groups, there tends to be much more capability of getting buy-in to a specific goal. Um, from a project management point of view, it's much easier to coordinate logistics if we're working from that kind of structured model of knowing exactly which tasks we want to accomplish to get the goals done. Um, and when we go to do evaluations, we can make sure that we build specific questions into evaluations that give us the answers as to whether those goals were met. However, um, I think a lot of people tend to, rightfully so, feel that being too regimented in these areas and to pick, like settling on goals that are a bit too specific is very limiting and very kind of in the, the model of museums don't want to take risks, museums don't, don't want to be able to experiment without having very concrete, sort of definable outcomes. Um, whereas on the other side, on the exploratory model, um, sometimes it's difficult to get buy-in from different stakeholders who you want to like be your participants in the project and they don't know exactly what you're trying to achieve and they're saying, why should we spend our time and effort helping you on this thing? We don't know what it's supposed to do. Um, sometimes that means that priorities kind of get reworked as the project goes on and that shifts and that means that you have to then rework a bunch of scheduling things to get things done. Um, and evaluations, um, I think in the moment when you're doing evaluations, if you're not kind of taking a step back and saying like, okay, what are the things that we think this achieved? What are the things that we're really kind of thinking might be the goals for this? The evaluation can kind of end up being much more open-ended as to like, was this good or bad? Did people like it or not? Was it kind of popular? And if so, yay, and if it wasn't popular, then bad. But that doesn't really give you as much specific information about how people were experiencing it, you know, what they were getting out of it. Um, but I will say that some of our probably most interesting and successful and original projects that we've done have kind of come from this particular model, um, just because we've been able to give ourselves the creative freedom to kind of work through a bunch of different options and land on something that we felt kind of instinctively was cool and interesting without necessarily needing to know exactly why it was ahead of time. Um, I'm probably not going to go to, into too much detail about these specific case studies, but um, I have examples that maybe we can bring up later in our conversation about like specific projects that we did that had these kind of trade-offs in terms of the, the way that the project was approached. Um, but I'll leave with the, the idea that when it comes um, to measuring value in terms of whether you're going to use that to make a decision about whether you're going to pursue that pro type of project again in the future, um, sometimes the question of value is not necessarily just what was the value to an audience kind of abstractly, but also was it worth all the effort that we put into it? Was it worth if the project structure was a huge headache? Was it worth it if we kind of alienated a bunch of our internal stakeholders? Was it worth it if it ended up costing a huge amount of money that we didn't anticipate because we didn't really plan for things properly? All of that kind of goes back to the, the question of value being kind of a cost-benefit analysis and not just a matter of like seeing numbers go up or down, but like are these numbers what we want to achieve based on the effort that we put into it? Hand it up to All right, as you heard, I am not Moat Cowan. <laughs> um, but thank you, uh, Sophie, for asking me to fill in. Uh, I am Nathan Atchison. I come from Local Projects. We are a full service exhibition design firm in New York. Uh, physical graphics, physical design, uh, experience design, content development, software development, um, the whole shebang. And I'm going to take on the role of a bit of a provocateur, or maybe the, the fly in the ointment, as an outsider, since I don't work in an institution. But I get to work with truly dozens of institutions every year, either through RFPs or actually on projects that we work on. I get to hear a lot of different needs and requests from, from different institutions. 
And you may or may not be surprised to hear that when it comes to the goals that they set, it's really all over the place. Uh, sometimes we have institutions that come where there's a, a funder and there's very clear evaluation metrics. There's, there's going to be a survey that's done before the show opens, during and after, and we're gonna measure how much people learned. Um, but other times we have free museums that come to us that because they don't even have ticketing, they don't even know how many visitors they have. So the goals for them are not numerical at all. Um, probably the most common request we hear is we want to bring in new audiences. And when you hear that, the, the one thing that then we say is, okay, if you want to bring in new audiences, the one thing that we know you're going to have to do is not exactly the same thing that you've been doing. <laughs> right? uh, to continue doing the same thing you've been doing but expect something else to happen is, I think, defined insanity. Uh, so so we, we lay it out like that. And what that means is people have to prepare for change, which makes everybody a little nervous. And the other thing that we have to tell people is the best practices you may be used to might not apply here. Uh, I, I don't love best practices. I could rant about best practices for a long time. I know we all come to conferences to learn and share best practices. Um, but th they're helpful, but they also can be kind of a path to the middle. Because if everybody's doing it, then you're not going to bring in new audiences. It's, it's not new and different enough. I also would caution us and we caution ourselves to be aware of what we can measure and how it impacts what we do measure. Meaning, if you can measure clicks, you end up saying, okay, we're gonna measure a lot of clicks or taps. But is, is that actually what we care about? Or are we just measuring that because it's the thing that we can measure? Um, if this was the corporate world or the retail world, all of the digital metrics about clicks or engagement or time are important because they ladder up eventually to conversion, because that's the assumption you're trying to sell something. We work in museums, we don't do that. We have a different purpose, we have a higher purpose. And uh, one reason why it was so great to work with Aros was they were very clear, that was the first thing they said to us, was museums have a social mission. And it, it goes beyond clicks, it goes just beyond engagement of that sort. Um, so I'm gonna go very quickly through three projects and talk about three potential new ideas for things that we could measure. I'm not saying let's disregard the things that we're already measuring, but uh, what I hope I can point to, and I hope this can lead to some good discussion after this, is uh, what are some other things that we can measure that both unlock our creativity, which to us as designers is very important, <coughs> but also help us keep our eye on really what the goal and what the purpose is of these institutions that we work for is. Uh, Maybe familiar with the Cooper Hewitt. This was a project of ours that opened a few years ago. Um, this is the digital pen. It's everyone's ticket to the museum. Uh, you can record anything that you see, uh, save it, come back and look at it later. The, the pen is also sort of a symbolic gesture to everyone that comes in. You're no longer an observer, you're a participant. The pen is in your hand. You are, you are a designer now. And there's all kinds of things you can do with a pen. Uh, one of the most successful was the immersive wallpaper room. The museum had one of the world's best collections of wallpaper swatches. But it's pretty hard to get excited about a wallpaper swatch <laughs> until you're given a pen in a giant room and it's now your job to design the wallpaper that surrounds you. And these are just images that were pulled from Instagram. We didn't design with this in mind. This is not the goal. No one said, uh, make an Instagram trap. Uh, what the museum said was, find a way to get people to relate to wallpaper in a new way. But what this points to, to me, I mean, I, I think of this as actual social media, meaning these are people actually being social and using media. <laughs> in the beginning, there was no sign that said take a picture, uh, share it. Actually, most people don't know this, but when we were designing this, there was a lot of debate, do we put stanchions in a velvet rope to keep people away from the projection screens? 
because they might fall in the needles or something. But eventually we decided, nope, let's, let's take them out. We didn't know that this was gonna happen. We did not know that people were gonna go stand in front of their creations. We thought that people would just sort of draw and they would look at what they created on the wall. So this was a big surprise <coughs> to us. And if you go to the Cougar Hewitt now, I swear people are using it as free daycare. They just like, drop their kids <laughs> off and just for, for 30 minutes or for 45 minutes, they'll just draw and draw and draw. Um, and yes, you can measure that in time. You can measure how much people share this stuff. But you also can stand there and you can just see the expressions on people's faces, which, which goes so far beyond a clip. And I, I, I think that's this opportunity that we have, and I don't want us to forget that. So one provocation I would just give is, let's, let's keep our eye on something that's emotional. This is, this is qualitative, right? But when you walk into that room, you can see smiles and you can hear laughs in a way that I really don't think you did in the museum before, especially design and art museums are, are often, it almost seems, designed to, you know, to suppress loud noises. You don't really expect to hear laughter in a, in a design museum or an art museum. What if we actually designed for that and measured that? Uh, next, this is uh, a slide from the Aris Public Project. When we are deciding what we are gonna measure, for us it's very, very helpful to also say what we're not. And so this is really a list of everything you might expect from maybe your, your typical in-gallery uh, media experience. But once we said no, that is not what this is about. It unlocked all of these other creative uh, potentials. And really what we came back to was what it must do is it must get two people working together, two people uh, socializing. So whether it's two people having their eyes tracked and talking about what they saw, oh, why did, why did you look at that part? I looked at this part. Or the recording booth, which requires two people, is designed with two people in mind. Um, or the portrait machine. And so this, again, this is totally unexpected. I don't think any of us expected um, this, this to happen. The way, the way this experience works is on the other side of this transparent screen is a person who is sort of coaching um, this person. They, they sort of take on the role of uh, the director and the model or the, the actual the artist in, and the model. And they're using works from the collection to layer on top and sort of create a collage of works from the, from the collection. But when, when I saw this, I thought, well, this also points to a new measure. We all know that museum fatigue is a real thing. That you know, most people go, and by the time they leave, they're exhausted. Uh, not uncommon for them to be angry, to just say, where, where is the bathroom? Where is coffee? I cannot think anymore. What if we measured something else? What if we measured actually how we energize people? How, when people leave the museum, right? This will energize you. This is not museum fatigue, this is the opposite. So what if we measured how much we're actually energizing people? And you can, you can see that. Um, finally, this, this will get a little bit more serious, but this is, a, this is a project that we just opened in Alabama, and this is the Equal Justice Initiative. This was with uh, Brian Stevenson, um, and it's on the, the site of a former slave warehouse and um, you know South Africa has um, their genocide um, they're the apartheid museum and Berlin has the, the Holocaust Museum and um, Brian Stevenson's message to us his challenge was uh, we, we really need to create something in this country that can help us heal and confront the, the reality of racial injustice in this country in a way that we haven't before. And several experiences, some involving media, some not. Brian's theory is that the, the legacy of slavery is not over. It really is it's just morphed into mass incarceration. And, and so this experience involves sitting and picking up a phone and, and hearing a story life-size from a wrongfully incarcerated person. So you are, you are truly embodying what it would be like to visit someone in prison. And 
This was covered on the front page of the New York Times. And again, it's not something we expected. Usually when you open a museum, you expect it to be covered and written about in the arts and culture and the design section. But once we saw this and we knew that this was possible, this set a new bar for us. We said, what if every project we do isn't just covered in the arts and culture pages? Because museums aspire to do a lot more than that. They actually aspire to change and shape the culture. So this is another project that we just opened. This is in Amsterdam. This is called uh, Fashion for Good. And this is a sort of hybrid museum retail experience about sustainable fashion. And again, we, we sort of set the bar here, and uh, you know, the bar that we tried to reach, which was how can we create something that is not perceived as just a museum, but is actively shaping culture. So what you, what you do here is you can see uh, sustainable products that can be bought, everything in it, all of the ink, everything is um, completely sustainable. But we you know, sort of borrowed something that was working from Cooper Hewitt, and we tried to push it forward, which is another thing that we do as designers. We look at what worked, and we think about how we can apply it to, to new audiences and new scenarios and new challenges. Uh, and so in this experience, you, you walk around, and you're actually making a commitment for something that you will change in the world, a way that you will be more sustainable. You will be more conscious about the decisions you make about the clothing that you buy. So that brings me to new metric number three. In addition to clicks or scans or time on site, how can we measure how what the museum is doing is shaping culture? Those are my thoughts. I think it's now time for roundtable. around with the mic here. Um, so yeah, I think one of the um, central questions that's come up in a lot of our discussions around these subjects is really kind of trying to use measurement as a force for good. Um, so I'd love to kind of open up that question to, to the group of kind of thinking about how goal setting and measurement has been kind of a positive influence. And then we'll probably go to the the second part of that question, which is really about like where can it be a hindrance, where can it be really a difficult part of your of your work? Um. <laughs> Emily, do you want to start off? I know you had a few kind of projects that you were you were thinking about this for. Yeah. Um, so I would say one of the projects that I think has benefited the most from having really kind of solid metrics laid out was um, the app that we designed with uh, Detour which you were a part of. <laughs> and um, as I think you know, we were targeting a, a rather unusual audience segment um, for this particular app because that was something that we decided that was a value to us, um, not just kind of overall take up rate and popularity exactly for the app, but really wanting to target a specific age demographic, which is a younger audience that doesn't always take um, a traditional museum audio guide. Um, and setting that as a goal was something that really kind of focused a lot of the design and um, content production around that project, I think, in a way that was really positive because it really kind of gave a lot of creative clarity to um, the type of audio content that we produced, which ended up being very much trying to emulate the sort of podcast model of um, kind of walking people through the museum and telling them a story that had kind of interesting perspectives and emotional um, affect to it. Um, and also being a little braver with the type of technology that we used, um, not necessarily wanting to just cater to people who are looking for ease of use with technology the way that um, a lot of our older audiences do, but kind of experimenting with a, a slightly harder to use sometimes, but much more social feature of being able to sync um, people's two phones together so that they could listen to something at the same time. Um, and I think when we went back and did evaluations, we realized that that target audience that we had been um, going after was, in fact, an audience that we were able to more successfully target than we might have if we'd gone after you know, a different strategy. So at this point, um, 
with that project, we unfortunately have lost Detour as a platform due to um, them being bought out as a company. <laughs> um, but what I'm kind of trying to do moving forward with our next iteration of whatever we end up doing for the audio guide is really trying to see what of the very concrete lessons that we took out of that we can use moving forward. Um, and I guess I would contrast that with some other examples where um, even though we, we have taken risks and we have seen kind of benefits of those risks, we still have, I think, more work to do in determining exactly what about that risk-taking behavior was successful and what that achieved and whether that achievement is something that we kind of value in that cost-benefit analysis sort of mindset. Um, you know, it was a benefit to us to target an audience that was younger, like the 18 to 35 audience, because we decided that one of our primary objectives was to get that audience to do something that they wouldn't maybe do in a more traditional museum environment. And because we knew that, that's a very specific thing that we can go after. When you, I think, take a risk on something and you see like generally it has a positive reception from people, that's great, but I think if you're wanting to sort of leverage that and use that moving forward to figure out like how can we apply this to the next project, it really does help to like have more framework put around it at some point during the project cycle to figure out like what is the specific lesson that we learned for why this worked, who did it work for, you know, what was the thing that was surprising or innovative or whatever about it. Um, maybe I can add a comment about the process. I think we had about nine months to make us public from the very beginning. Everything has to be changed. So we couldn't have done it without having the goals really upfront. Also, as Nathan said, every all the things we couldn't do or didn't want to do. Um, so it was really important as a tool in the process, and it still is. Um, but also about measuring things. As you could see, there's a lot of tracks in the eye tracker, for instance. But how do I? What do I do with the numbers? I don't know if it's a lot of numbers, a lot of tracks or not, because I cannot compare to anything. And the same thing with the recordings. I can see that so many people save their recordings, and the same with the portrait machine. But how do I measure it? I think that's uh, <laughs> sometimes a little hard. To continue as provocateur. I would like to ask, this is a question, how much, if we think the ability to measure all of the things digitally that we are is actually leading us to better work, to, to bolder, uh, more transformational, more effective work? Because if it's not, it's not helpful, right? So I, I, I think keeping, keeping our eye on that ball, again, coming back to, to why we're here and why we do this, if we can use these things that we measure digitally to, to achieve the potential that we have, then great, by all means, let's, let's do them. Um, but what, what isn't helpful, I would say, let, let's just talk hypothetically. Let's say, uh, let's imagine that, let, let's take Aros. Let's say people came to Aros before that for, for two hours. They would come for a, a two hour session, they would, they, would, they would go around until they were exhausted. Uh, now they still may come for two hours, but if they spend 30 minutes at Eros Public, still two hours, but they spent an hour and a half in the galleries with the physical art, and they spent 30 minutes with the experiences on the third floor. If you just look at that as the time spent on site, which some people might, some people might just measure it that way, some people might say, you're actually spending less time in the galleries now. Yeah, but maybe it's, it's less but better. So I, I'm, I'm just posing this question to say, if we boil it down to something as reductive as sometimes something like number of clicks or, or time on site can be, I think we, we might be missing the big picture. Um, I might add to that too, that that to me kind of speaks to the question also of um, whether you're kind of working backwards from the data and saying like, we have all this data and now we're gonna try and like make meaning out of it somehow and just see if we can find a pattern somewhere versus um, knowing the specific questions that you want to ask and knowing like this specific data point may or may not be able to speak to that. We might want to do something that's qualitative to be able to speak to that. We might 
just need to look around to figure out what is the best way of actually answering this question instead of sort of taking data as always the first step. Yeah, I know there was a question from the audience. Yeah, I think um, we could probably go into a whole data, data privacy conversation, but I'll bring it back just to the intentionality of the data use, which I think is a really important component of what you're saying, which is, are we being intentional? Are we setting things up in a way that are going to be helpful? Um, and I will certainly say from my perspective, um, that's something that we've been trying to do at the Whitney with Colin Brooks Health, who's sitting here in the front row. We really kind of started from a place of not really being able to look at our data in a very effective way. We set up a data studio, we started tracking certain aspects of our work in ways that we hadn't done before, and one of the most significant ones was actually looking at the way our exhibitions performed. I think at our, at our institution, we're very exhibition driven, but we actually don't measure exhibitions in a way that is helpful to like the, the, you know, the people in our groups and um, you know, across the kind of content and product groups. Um, to really be able to analyze our success based on exhibitions. So we've started actually looking at our data in that way, and that intentionality is really helpful. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're, you know, we're not going to be producing a piece of content about an exhibition, but it might say that a certain strategy around content isn't, isn't helpful, or uh, we might have seen surprising results for, for an exhibition. So there was one um, really small exhibition that was on um, earlier this year, um, an artist who we weren't expecting to be at all kind of a, a big deal and and her show took off online and we were able to kind of really look at that that um, um, that data in a way that we couldn't before and so that was really meaningful for us to sort of say you know we've started tracking this in a way that's now helpful to the conversation it doesn't mean that we're not ever going to you know do the big shows and we're going to concentrate everything on the small shows of course we're not you know, we're not driven by the data, but we're informed with it. We can kind of make decisions and we can make arguments. And I'd say that's where, for me, there's definitely a hindrance in terms of um, uh, setting targets and trying to hit a certain number of clicks. Like that doesn't really help. I think what we're trying to do is look at behavior. Um, and I think that gets to your point too, in terms of the physical space. It's like, it doesn't, like the, just the number doesn't help you. Like what was the actual behavior within that? Um, within that metric. And I think um, to that point, um, when we were talking earlier, Nathan, and I think kind of talking about the, the, the ways in which we might measure this kind of work, we started talking about how we might measure empathy. And um, I would put this question to you, Nathan, because I feel like you guys do this a lot. You're really thinking about like how to change, the, create an emotional response. Um, what are some of the ways that you set those goals for yourselves as, a, as an institution? Like how do you, you've got the institutional goals, like we might say, you know, we're trying to hit change something or trying to do something, how, how do you set that up for yourselves as, as designers? Uh, we're really hard on ourselves and each other. Uh, <laughs> and what I mean by that is we're, we're always asking ourselves and each other, so what, who cares? Mm -hmm. And I think all of those of you who work in the institutions, you, you care, you care deeply, deeply, deeply about your material, you know it from back, there are many visitors who, who don't. They just don't, they don't have that knowledge. And so that becomes our challenge. And so for us, putting ourselves in the shoes of a visitor is to, to ask pretty bluntly and really not give ourselves the benefit of the doubt and just continue saying, well, why do I care? Why do I care? Who cares? Why do I care? Which, I mean, can, can get difficult for us too because you know we, we have these big, creative ideas and we think they're fun and then someone else we you know we bring in someone from another team who's uh, 
not working on the same project, and they say, all right, so what? And it, that, that's just the cycle, is to, is to overcome and get to a good answer to the so what make me care question. And the answer usually comes not, not verbally. It comes from something that someone is doing and you can see it. And so that's why I pointed to that first example. When someone draws with a pen and you see their face light up, that, that answers the question. Empathy is not something really that you, you can hear from something someone says. You, you, you feel it. You, you, you empathize by doing. It's not an intellectual exercise. We could kind of carry on, but I want to make sure there's enough time for questions. Yeah. Uh, I'm really intrigued because goal setting usually inhibits risk taking, um, just by the nature of the exercise. But the example from SF Norma in terms of exploratory as an actual framework for um, uh, you know how you approach it. And, and I'm curious because I think you showed the three interactives as one of your examples on the exploratory side. Which is fascinating because I know a lot of people have gone there and had very uh, different points of view in terms of mm -hmm. what that was. And the question that I typically get when I ask people about it, they ask me, well, do you know what they were trying to do? And to know that it was exploratory <laughs> is actually <laughs> very informative that, okay, you guys were trying to explore. You weren't necessary. I, don't, I mean, I'd love to hear your answer, but what were you trying to achieve, even in the exploratory side? Because I know people who adore that and say that's the greatest thing that they've ever seen, and then folks on the other side as well. So uh, how do you evaluate that experience also? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a very interesting one, actually, because I think overall, the response to this project has been very positive. Um, and there's, I think, been very kind of negative responses on the other side from some people. Um, to give a bit of context to what this project is, um, we had basically um, interactive panels um, that showed like digital versions of Magritte pieces that people could then step in front of and they would their image would become part of the piece. So we've gotten responses from visitors ranging from like, this is so cool, I feel like I'm part of the artwork, I feel like the artwork has been deconstructed for me in this sort of way that actually makes me learn about what the artwork is. So on the other side, being like, this is shallow, this is a selfie machine, basically. Um, and we did not necessarily have very defined aims, even in terms of like, we definitely didn't have defined metrics for success for this project. I don't think that we really had very strongly articulated goals within the institution about what the general aim of the project was. And part of the reason why I kind of wanted to focus on the, um, the project management side of this whole question too is that that project caused quite a lot of angst and anxiety <laughs> internally with people you know we had our, our exhibition um, technical team kind of being brought into this project in a way that I don't think they were fully included in the creative process in a way that might have been most productive and so we had a lot of problems actually executing on this project because it sort of felt to a certain number of our teammates that we were kind of just like doing our own thing, having fun, playing around at their expense to a certain extent. Um, and so when we come back to the question internally of whether we're going to be trying experiments like that again, even though I think our, our results you know, were generally quite positive from an audience point of view, we really have to take that question very seriously of like, if we do this again, how can we really structure this project in a way that it's worthwhile, that the results that we're getting out of it are worth you know, the kind of internal angst that, that, that happened. Um, and I think you said something else about, what well, you, you were asking kind of just like what the, the kind of general benefit of the exploratory model is as well, which I think it's important to emphasize that there is one, that um, it's not, you know, I think, maybe I'll turn the question around actually and say like, I'm trying to, to strategize about ways to incorporate that freedom of, of ex exploration and, and trying new things and not necessarily being so hung up on outcomes that you can't take risks with the idea of creating a structured project that everyone can get on board with and everyone kind of knows enough about what they're doing to say like, yes, this is worth doing. 
Um, and I would really like to know if anyone in the audience <laughs> has thoughts about that, or you know, this seems like a, a really hard nut to crack, so I would love to continue that part of the conversation. Is there anyone who wants to weigh in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to grab the mic? Uh, you probably back. Okay, um, so I, I guess I want to make a case for um, designing for different kinds of effects and um, which I think is largely what you were getting at, Nathan, with your really good examples. I think that too often we have designed, especially digital projects in the museum space, as information delivery vehicles. Mm -hmm. And what they deliver is information. Mm -hmm. And that can lead to all kinds of knowledge acquisition and learning. And I'm very uh, enthusiastic about digital projects as learning products. But that's a very narrow definition. Mm -hmm. and so. Perhaps we ought to be defining the kinds of effects that we want to have on people more broadly in terms of it could be skill acquisition, it could be increased confidence in looking at art in a modern art museum, it could be emotional impact, it could be behavior change. But um, those, are, those are much more, I think, that kind of broad landscape in terms of effect um, really shifts how you think about measurement. And I would take issue with the idea that like, having objectives for a project limits the creative possibilities. I think if your objectives for a project are, let's make a video, you have already shut down the creative <laughs> But if your objectives are, we want people to come out of this experience feeling more confident in looking at modern art, you have a pretty big palette to work with still. I think those are excellent points, and we were talking about um, Sort of one pain point I think around goal setting is actually around creating shared goals between institutional departments. I think that's probably part of like where the pain points around goal setting comes from because you know one department might have very different ideas of what is important in terms of that goal setting. But I would I would absolutely agree with you. I think um, in my recent experience in terms of content strategy, letting go of some of those information sharing goals really helps. A, it release creativity, but also it kind of, I think, um, helps lessen the anxiety around the end product. You know, if the end product doesn't have to meet that specific goal, it kind of opens up the conversation for what else could it be, yeah. which I think then it helps the other stakeholders involved. So we, we just launched a big Warhol exhibition, and a lot of the conversations were around, you know, um, uh, limited time to get things done in, very big ambitious projects, very big expectations, and kind of... Um, like ROI kind of um, hopes and dreams for the institution, but and, and, and part of what was helpful in terms of limiting some of the content goals was around saying, look, there's a limited bandwidth that curatorial is gonna be able to kind of participate with us in terms of getting this done. We already know that we're gonna achieve certain goals with you know, the catalog, with um, you know, the kind of in-gallery deliverables that are being done. We can do some different things around the digital engagement that, um, that maybe we wouldn't be able to freed up be freed up to do ordinarily, but like this is this is an opportunity, and I think that framing like that it really helps. And for me, in my role, I'm not in charge of all of the different kind of social media um, aspects that we're that we're working on, but I'm really um, involved in thinking about how our media engagement is going to work in those channels. And one of the the things that I um, most um, bristle at is being asked, you know, like make a successful, like, you know, social video, make it go viral. It's like, ah! <laughs> you know, that's not, it's a bit like the make the video thing. It's like, it's not, you know, if that's my goal, like, I'm totally gonna fail from the beginning. But if my goal is like, what are the totally different ways that are exciting and interesting and different that I could tell a story, then I might end up with a really interesting viral video kind of as an outcome of that. But I think that, for me, I think the goal setting is, is, is helpful as a limiter for the, it's sort of like the anti goals. It's like every project now has the goals and anti goals for mm -hmm. for a content strategy. So I think that's a I think it's a great point. Yeah, we have when we did the recording booth, it was because we knew that a lot of our audience of visitors they felt it was really difficult to talk about art. They didn't know what to say, especially men for some reason <laughs> found it very <laughs> difficult. Uh, so we made the recording booth to make this safe space for unsafe ideas you can say and you can hear in the recording booth that people are really trying to to say something they normally wouldn't say and you can see it in their 
way of talking, the expressions, that's what touched me so much every morning when I go through them, because they are really trying. And what we do not know is what effect it has when they go and see the rest of the galleries. It could be really interesting to look into. Um, and one of the things I remember we discussed was what, how much information do we want to give the audience before they leave uh, the recording booth or after, because they can send, when they have done the recording, they can send, uh, they can have a make, they can uh, have the email, the do -do -do, <laughs> and then they can have the recordings um, in their inbox with some information about the artworks, but not any master's voice at all. They can also have the portrait uh, sent home. And of course, it's kind of a souvenir from the museum, but we were really discussing how much information should you give about the artwork, because we are an art museum. We are the authority. I'm an art historian myself, so I would love to give the right version <laughs> of this artwork. But we were looking at the objectives and saying, no, it would really undermine the whole thing, because we want people to be confident. We want people to know that in the eye tracker, you have eyes, you have a body, and therefore you can look at art. Instead of starting up with a long uh, meters of text. So in art museum, for some reasons, very often you see text before pictures, even though we are a picture house. Mm -hmm. So this about giving people, the, to make people believe in that they are so good at looking at art, just because they're human beings, and art is so much about being human beings. So that's some of the goals, and I'm so happy we didn't put in a lot of stuff of, of uh, art history, which they can anyway find just by Google the artwork in two seconds. Uh, and then we have the nine other levels at the museum which <laughs> where they can find a lot of information. So maybe it's good sometimes to say, this is not about the right version, it's about the communication and the interaction between setting is, is critical. I think I, I'm curious if what your thoughts are in, in terms of, I mean, I think where the creativity needs to come in is the methodology. Uh, we have to be open to surprising data when we do these evaluations, uh, and we have to be willing to rethink the whole nature of our enterprise. Um, I think the design patterns that we, that I see mostly employed, I mean, it really should be a transmedia approach in terms of design patterns for gallery visits. I think right now the present model is mostly broken in, in current art galleries because there's the sanctity of the gallery and then there's these play spaces uh, and they really should be integrated um, because they're all entry points for your visitors. Um, and I think what I find most uh, problematic, like uh, not to pick on SF Mobile, but with, with the Madrid show, uh, I mean the play space is right at the end, right before the gift shop. And so there's no chance for you to draw empathy from your experience place it back within the art uh, because it happens at an end point. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's good or bad, but it's not integrated. So mm -hmm. um, as visual experience designers, we have to think about really master experience mm -hmm. planning and how those emotional notes or how a visitor, like if we have those goals set, then our methodology should be creative enough to answer some of those approaches. Uh, I think that's a really great point. And I think um, that kind of speaks to one of my concerns around that project is that I feel like because we had an overall positive outcome, maybe that was a, a, a factor that might not have been taken into consideration because if, if that had been articulated as a goal or a more general aim to, to get people to sort of have that particular experience that you're describing, then maybe, you know, that might have been factored more into our evaluations. We might be taking that into consideration more when we go back and try and figure out how we're going to do these types of um, paired, interactive with exhibition type experiences uh, in the future. Um, whereas I think sometimes we have been prone to falling into the trap at SF MoMA of saying like, because we want to do something that's exciting and new and innovative, we don't want to put too many restrictions on it that will then stymie our ability to, to do those new innovative things that everyone's kind of battling us in the institution we perceive. Um, to, to prevent us from doing because we're the, the sort of vanguard innovators and we need to kind of just like do our, our new innovative thing because it's 
innovative and new. <laughs> Um, and then that, that's where the, the conversation kind of ends in a certain way. Um, that's what I was talking to the group before about of, of having sort of tautological goals is what I call them, where you achieve the goal by, by doing the thing, and then you can call yourself successful, but you don't really have like deeper learnings to take back about like how you can improve an overall experience, what the really deeper nuances of the experience are from the user's point of view. Yeah, I think I think that's sort of um, tying those two points together. That the I think the sort of looking at our content strategy across our institutions, both physical and online, is something that I think a lot about. Because I think in the same way that you were talking about these isolated spaces, I think people talk about kind of what what's possible in the physical space, and then this kind of whole separate universe online. It's like, well, that's not how we are operating. I mean, clearly we want we can achieve different things in those different spaces, and they're not. Um, you know, it's not that you're trying to translate one to the other, they're very different, but I also think that we don't think of our institution's content strategy as these four, you know, competing now, like, right? That might be the end of the, end of the session, it's five o'clock, I'm like, shut up, we want to go get drinks. Um, but yeah, I would, I would say I think that's, like, another, another good point of discussion. Right, I think we're done. <laughs>